Hello everyone, welcome to KJB Believers, and today I'm with uh, Brother Samuel here again, and I was just talking to him for a bit, and and he came up with uh, this idea, well not really came up with it, but he mentioned, you know, an idea on the 17 raptures of the Bible, and I checked through the scriptures, and it looks like it could very well be, you know, it's something crazy, wow, when you think of something, oh, the 17 raptures, that seems like, whoa, a bit a bit extreme to some people, you know, but but I, I figured this, uh, this study here would be a blessing to you all. And it just goes to show that God is still revealing more of his precious word. All right. So I'm going to pass it to Brother Sammy here. You can take it over, man. All right. So as he said, uh, I believe there are 17 raptures in the King James Bible. And, you know, uh, some people would, would you know, kind of wince at that idea and say, you know, oh, I've never heard such a thing. That must be heresy or something like that. But what I hope to show you today is that there are indeed 17 raptures in the King James Bible. Uh, that's what I believe, and perhaps somebody might find more. And uh, if that's the case, then I'm willing to adjust my outline. But right now I believe there's 17, affirm 17 raptures in the King James Bible. Now, uh, what I first want to do is uh, turn to Proverbs 18.13. And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 13, the Bible says, He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Okay, so just because you haven't heard this kind of teaching or this kind of idea before, that does not mean that, you know, it's not true. Okay, you are to hear me out, and, you know, as, as the Bereans in Acts 17, 11, we are to search the scriptures to prove whether the things we hear are so. And uh, I would like you to do that for this message. I would like you to have your King James Bible out, either on your desk or in your lap there, and turn to the scriptures with me and check me out. See if what I'm saying is so, and see if what I'm saying lines up with the Word of God. Okay? So again, this study is on the 17 raptures in the King James Bible. Now before I get into it, and we take a deep dive all across the scriptures to look at these 17... First, I want to talk about the word rapture itself, okay? The word rapture is a theological term, okay? That's important to understand. The word rapture is a theological term. It is a term used to describe a certain concept or doctrine in the Bible. So in, in one sense, the word rapture is biblical, but in another sense, it's not. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is that is that while the word rapture does not appear in the King James Bible, you know, say say you start reading in Genesis and read all the way to Revelation chapter 22, you're not going to find the word rapture in the Bible. But what you will find certainly is the concept and the doctrine of a rapture or quote unquote raptures in the Bible. So in one sense it is biblical, and in another sense it's not. The word's not found there, but that doesn't mean the concept isn't found in the Bible because I'm going to show you 17 instances of where the concept is found in the Bible. Now, while the Bible does use some theological terms, like forms of uh, forms of these words, justification, sanctification, propitiation, you, you see those words or forms of those words in the scriptures. There are other theological terms that are just as biblical, but they don't appear explicitly in the in the text as words. So for instance, you know, the word Trinity, uh, many people use the word Trinity, though that word's not found in the Bible. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, using that word is absolutely, you know, heretical and, you you know, you can't use that word. Trinity just means triunity. It means three in one. And if you turn the first John 5, 7, you'll see that, yeah, the Godhead, which is would be the biblical term, is three in one. You know, for these three uh, bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. One and three and three and one and the one in the middle died for me, uh, as some people say. So, so just because a theological term doesn't appear in the scriptures doesn't mean that 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 particular doctrine is not scriptural. Uh, another example of this would be the word omnipresent. Okay, The word omnipresent means, you know, everywhere. You know, like, for instance, as applied to God, that means God is everywhere. Okay? And, uh, and you know, we, we don't believe in pantheism, that, you know, God is in everything. So, like, he's not, like, in my desk. He's not part of this pen I have on my desk. But he is in the room. He fills the universe. He is everywhere. But though he's separate from his creation because he created it. So just because that word omnipresent doesn't appear in the scriptures doesn't mean the concept and the doctrine of his omnipresence isn't in the scriptures. Because if you look at uh, what David said in the Psalms, in Psalm 139, he clearly testifies to the fact that, yeah, God is omnipresent. Psalm 139.8, the Bible says, 
If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. So God's everywhere. He's in heaven. He's in hell. He's in the room with me. Uh, he's outside your house. He's everywhere. Okay? He's omnipresent. So just because that theological term doesn't appear in the scriptures doesn't mean the doctrine isn't in the Bible. And the same thing applies to the word rapture, the theological term. That's what needs to be understood and clarified. Now, what does the word mean? Okay, there, you know, uh, the word is used often in uh, in Christianity, especially in the Western world. And because it's used so much, uh, it's kind of lost some of its meaning. And people have different ideas as to what constitutes a rapture. Okay, but really, simply, in a nutshell, a rapture is being lifted up, held, and placed down in another place by God. Okay. Really, that simply that that's all rapture is in the Bible. It's when God takes somebody bodily, He lifts them up, lifts them, and places them down somewhere else. Now, the most famous examples of these would be when God takes somebody, lifts them up, and places them in heaven. Okay, uh, th those are the most fam famous examples, and we're going to talk about that. But not every rapture is when God takes somebody and places them in the heaven. Uh, sometimes God will take a person, an individual, or a group of people, he'll lift them up, and then he'll place them down somewhere else on the earth. That happens, and we're going to see that. But as I said, the word rapture implies a person or a group being lifted up, held, and placed down by God in another place. Okay, And as I said, God does this to individuals, and he does this to groups of people as well. Now, uh, the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which is pretty good, despite its imper imperfections, uh, that dictionary defines rapture as a seizing and a transport. And really, that's what it is. It's when God takes somebody, he seizes them, and then he transports them. He puts them somewhere else. Simply put, that's all, that's all it means. Now, the biblical terms for what we, what we call a rapture would be caught up and taken or took, and we're going to see that. Now, um, the Bible says God takes certain people and has taken people in the past, and he has caught up people. So those would be the biblical terms for the word rapture. Now, even secular dictionaries and their definitions convey the same sort of meaning. Uh, from, uh, from these dictionaries, you know, written by atheists and agnostics, they even, uh, they even give the same sense of the word in their definitions. One dictionary says, written by these kind of people, says, a feeling of intense pleasure or, or joy. That's what they define rapture as. And when you think about it, when you're raptured, uh, <laughs> if you were taken by God, you know, especially taken to heaven, you know, in a rapture, uh, boy, you, you would feel uh, an intense feeling of pleasure or joy. And uh, if, if you don't think that's the case, ju just, uh, just wait until you're raptured if you're saved, amen? Now also, according to these uh, same type of dictionaries, the word rapturous would mean the nature of any activity that took one out of oneself, so to speak. And we will see that that is literally recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, where it's described literally as somebody being taken out of oneself, so to speak. And the last thing I want to say is so that there's you know no confusion, is that not every resurrection is a rapture. Not every resurrection is a rapture, and vice versa. Okay, not every rapture is a resurrection. So, as we're going to see, there are raptures where God does rapture somebody and takes them somewhere, whether another place on earth or in heaven, and that does not involve a resurrection. And there's other times where God resurrects a group of people and then takes them, uh, and then takes them somewhere, raptures them. Okay, so, so sometimes a resurrection and a rapture are connected and put into the same event, but not every resurrection is a rapture and vice versa. Now, if you were to ask the average Christian how many raptures there are in the Bible, they would probably say there's only one, okay? And I understand why they say that. Uh, number one is, you know, so sometimes, you know, it's not their fault. Sometimes they just haven't been taught. Um, and other times, you know, they, they just don't really know their Bible too well, okay? But the reason why most Christians, especially in the Western world, would say there's only one rapture is because they only focus on one rapture. And that would be the rapture of the church, which we're going to get to. 
And I understand that, you know, that that's the rapture we're certainly supposed to be focusing on, looking for, waiting for, expecting, because the Lord Jesus Christ could come back at any moment. It's imminent, and that is our blessed hope, and we are to love his appearing. We're to be looking for him to come back. So I understand why many people would say, oh, yeah, there's only one, because they only focus on that one. But when you get reading through the Bible, there are other raptures that have happened in the past, and even in my opinion, there might be some others that happen in the future as well outside of the rapture of the church. Okay, but, you know, many people would say there's only one rapture because that's the rapture they focus on. And there's nothing wrong with focusing on that uh, because that's the rapture that pertains most in importance when it comes to when it comes to Christians living on the earth today. So just wanted to say that in opening. And one other thing I would like to say is that is that if, if you were to ask many people, you know, like dispensational students of the Bible, like myself, if if they hadn't really studied it too, too in depth, they they would probably say, oh, you know, there's probably seven. You know, if you were to ask them how many raptures, they'd probably say, oh, you know, m maybe there's seven. And I understand why they say that. Uh, one reason they say that is because God uses the number seven all throughout the scriptures. Even from the very beginning to the end of the Bible, God uses sevens, Okay. You know, um, during the creation week, you know, he he instituted the week of seven days, six days of creation, one day of rest. That's seven. Uh, at the very end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, there's Daniel's 70th week, a week of years. There's seven years. He's go through the whole Bible. God uses sevens over and over again, repeatedly, repeatedly. And, and there are even some sevens that are hidden in the Bible. Okay. But what you'll find is that, yeah, God does use the, the number seven. It's the number of perfection and completion. And because, you know, there's other doctrines of the Bible that involve sevens, like the seven resurrections, the seven uh, baptisms, the, the seven main mysteries in the Bible, um, because of that, some people would say, okay, there's probably seven raptures in the Bible. Well, I'm here to tell you that I believe there's more than that, that there's 17, but there's still a seven in it, because you have 17 raptures. And, um, and I will say that uh, to those... To those people who are questioning, okay, well, maybe there's a group of seven in the 17. I can definitely say that, yes, there is a group of seven in the 17, uh, which I'll talk about briefly now. Um, I, wouldn't, I won't go into detail because we're going to cover them. But uh, there was an old preacher, his name was Dr. Ruckman, and he, uh, he came up with an outline of nine trips in outer space. Nine trips into outer space. And he has this recorded in his, uh, in his, where, in his rare and out-of-print book, The Rapture. And... He has that outline in there, and, and you say, okay, well, that's nine. Where, where's the seven? Well, the first two trips are unsuccessful and end in a, in a disaster. Okay, the, the first two so-called trips in outer space are, number one, Lucifer, in Isaiah 14, where he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. Okay, he wanted to ascend into heaven. Okay, that ended in disaster. And the other one would be Genesis chapter number 11, where, you know, with the Tower of Babel, they're trying to, to reach up into heaven, okay? And then God, you know, confounded their languages and separated them and all that kind of stuff. So those, those first two trips in outer space were successful or ended in disaster. The, the other seven in his outline, which we will cover, the other seven in his outline were successful trips made in outer space by individuals, and each one is a rapture, and uh, I'm not going to go into it specifically, but perhaps um, perhaps the outline will be shared afterwards. But we're going to see that, yeah, th there are seven successful trips into outer space made by individuals, and I'm not going to cover them in depth now. Uh, we'll, we'll see those in a few seconds. But what I will say is that within these 17, there are five sets of three chronological raptures. There are five sets of three chronological raptures. So we're going we're gonna to start with the Old Testament, move on to the New Testament, and see these groups of three, these pairs of three, of three chronological raptures. And then we'll be left with two at the end, which also match each other. So first we're going to see three individual chronological bodily raptures in each testament. So that is to say that both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there are three individuals who got raptured by themselves. Okay, they were raptured alone. They won't they weren't raptured in a group, they're raptured by themselves. And they are in chronological order when um when moving through and progressing through the Bible. 
So first, let's go and deal with the first one. And uh, we'll turn to Genesis chapter number 5 for the first one of this set. And this is one of the first raptures mentioned in the Bible. So Genesis chapter number 5. Genesis chapter number 5. We'll start with verse 24. That's the verse we'll focus on. Okay, Genesis chapter number 5 is a genealogy. It's the first genealogy mentioned in the Bible. And all throughout the genealogy, you see death. You see death. So in verse number 5, interesting, Genesis 5, 5. 5 is the number of death in the Bible. But in Genesis 5, 5, it says, In all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he what? It said, and he died. If you look at verse 8, it says, All the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Same thing in verse number 11. And all the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. Verse 14, and all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. So th this genealogy is filled with death. Okay, it's filled with death. And, uh, and you know, it, it's verse 1, it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Okay, so Adam's genealogy is filled with death. And it's interesting, you know, here's a little nugget of truth for you. Uh, there, there, there's only one other verse in the Bible that, that, that says the book of the generations of, and that's Matthew chapter one, and that's the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, and that's his genealogy. And in his genealogy, there's no death recorded, okay? There's no death recorded because all in Adam die, but those that live in Jesus Christ shall be made alive. Of course, I'm paraphrasing the verse. I don't have it in front of me, but that's just a good nugget there. But regardless, Genesis chapter five is about death. Now, why do you mention that? Well, I mention that because there's one person here that that has no death recorded. So he's kind of uh, an outlier. It's a peculiar verse here, but it says in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, it says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not. Okay? And he was not. He was not what? Well, we're going to see that in a second. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. For God took him. Remember that. For God took him. So what happened was, Enoch walked with God. This is before the flood, obviously. Enoch walked with God, and God took him. God took him to heaven. Now, uh, why do you say that? Well, because Hebrews chapter number 11. If you turn to Hebrews chapter number 11, we'll get more revelation on what happened exactly to Enoch. We know God took him, and you know that, that's, that's the Bible's terminology for a rapture, where God takes somebody or catches them up. But you'll see, but you'll see in Hebrews chapter 11... Verse 5, you'll see Enoch mentioned again. And it says here, Genesis 11, uh, excuse me, we were just in Genesis, Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 5, concerning Enoch, it says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. So Enoch didn't die. His, de his death was not recorded because he didn't die. Okay, it, it, you know, it, it wasn't that, you know, Moses just, oh yeah, he forgot Enoch died. No, Enoch didn't die. He was not. He was not found. We're going to see here. But also worth considering is that is that word translated. I encourage all of you to do a do a study on that word translated in the King James Bible. Uh, you'll come to interesting conclusions, and you'll see that all the characteristics of the translations mentioned in the Bible are the same characteristics that this translation of the King James Bible has. But anyway, it says, "By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found." Nobody found him. So, you know, one day, you know, Enoch was walking with God, walking with the Lord, and uh, God just took him. He raptured him, and he was not found. <laughs> People were probably looking all over the place for Enoch, wondering where he went, but they didn't find him because God took him. And the verse moves on. It says, because God had translated him, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Okay, so that's the first one, is Enoch. God took him. Now, the next one of this set in the Old Testament of three chronological bodily raptures, is Moses. First one was Enoch. Now we're going to move on to Moses, particularly the body of Moses. If you will, go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy 34. Deuteronomy 34. And we're going to see an interesting picture here. Deuteronomy 34, the last chapter of the, of the Pentateuch, the so-called five books of Moses. Deuteronomy 34, verse 5. And again, remember, 5 is the number of death. 
And it just so happens that a death is recorded in this verse. Genesis 34, uh, excuse me, keep saying Genesis. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse number 5, it says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him. Who buried him? Well, what's the antecedent? Previous verse, the Lord. So it said, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. He died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he, the Lord, buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. So it's very interesting. Um, I, I'm sure that this is probably the, the only person in the Bible that is, ex, that is explicitly mentioned that God buried him. You know, the, the Bible says, you know, uh, Jesus Christ specifically said, you know, let the dead bury their dead. And that's usually what happens is mankind buries fallen man. That's what happens when somebody dies. Men get together and bury them and pay for a funeral and all that. But that is not what happened in this case. What happened here is the Lord buried him. Now, why did the Lord bury him? Well, we're going to see in, in a second why he probably buried him. But it said, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. So his body was not found, just like Enoch. Enoch's body was not found. It was taken. It was taken. God took his body, took Enoch. And I believe God took Moses' body, for it was not found. Now, as we'll see, we're going to get more clarification on this from the scriptures. Go ahead and turn to the book of Jude. Go ahead and turn to the book of Jude. And we're going to look at verse number 9. Scripture with scripture is the best interpreter. It's the best, com the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself comparing spiritual things with spiritual. In Jude chapter 1, verse 9, of course, there's only one chapter in Jude, the Bible says, yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, so he was fighting with the devil over something. Yeah, Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about, about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Okay? So Michael the archangel, some kind of chief angel here, was fighting with the devil. Okay? And he was fighting over the devil. He was fighting with the devil over the body of Moses. That was the point of contention. It was Moses's corpse, his dead body. And and you know that there there have been some theories and some conjectures from people saying that oh, you know, the the devil wanted Moses's body so that he could, you know, have people worship it. And I understand why they say that because for instance, the Catholics do that. You know, they they have dead saints and uh, and, and all kinds of relics from dead bodies and everything that they worship and reverence and quote-unquote venerate. Um, that's a good theory, but I believe the Bible tells us why Moses was after the body and why God buried his body in the first place. But we see here that Michael the archangel was sent in order to fight with, with the devil over the body uh, because God didn't want the devil having access to, the, to Moses' body for whatever reason. Now we're going to see probably why all of this transpired. Turn to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. We're going to see that the body of Moses did not stay buried. Okay, It appears in the first century during Jesus' earthly ministry. We see in Matthew chapter number 17, starting in verse 1, Many of you are probably familiar with this passage. The Bible says, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, that's the inner circle of disciples there, and he taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them two witnesses, so to speak. Okay, Who, who are these two people that appear? Moses and Elias. Elias is the Greek form of the, of the name Elijah. Okay, so in verse 3, we see they're on the Mount of Transfiguration. And behold, two, two witnesses, you could say, two people uh, from the Old Testament show up. And it says, behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. So we see that Moses' body did not stay buried. Okay, he did not stay buried because uh, it appears here on the Mount of Transfiguration in the first century. Now, now you say, okay, well, maybe that was just the souls of Moses and Elias. Well, the thing is with that is that souls are invisible to the naked eye, to the carnal eye, okay? 
a natural man cannot see a soul. Okay, God has to open your eyes in order for that to happen. And and when that does happen, the Bible records it. You know, for instance, uh, in the book of the Kings, in First and Second Kings, it records a story where a servant's eyes were opened and he was able to see spiritual things. But that did not happen here. Um, and of course. Uh, if it was their souls, it probably would have said, you know, for instance, in Revelation, it says, John saw, you know, the souls of them that were beheaded, okay? So th that's when he was seeing the souls. But here it just says Moses and Elias. They were in the flesh. Moses' body did not stay buried. And the reason it didn't stay buried and the Lord buried him was so that his body could be used in the future. It was used here. And we're going to see it's going to be used in the future again. So the Lord buried Moses' body. So that nobody could find it. And then the devil comes along and fights with Michael, the archangel, over it. And I believe what Michael did is he took the body, and that's why it was never found. You know, people were probably looking for it, but it was never found. Just like Enoch, his body was never found. Moses' body was never found. I believe just like Enoch, Moses' body was taken to heaven so that it could be used again. Uh, it was probably taken shortly after he had died, died before it saw corruption, so that his body could be used again first here on the Mount of Transfiguration. And we're going to see here in a second, it will be used in the tribulation period, so-called, the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week. If you will, turn with me to Revelation chapter number 11, and we'll see when it's going to be used in the future. Revelation chapter number 11. And we're going to be starting in verse number three. Revelation 11, three, it says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. So, so they are going to prophesy for three and a half years. That's uh, 1260. That, that's the amount of days. So half of the tribulation period. And verse 4, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Verse 5, verse 5 and 6, we're going to see some clues as to who these people are. And I believe it can be proven almost conclusively that these two people are Moses and Elias, or Elijah, as recorded in the Old Testament. In verse 5, it says, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. Well, in the case of Moses and Elijah... Uh, there, there, there are instances where fire did come and devour their enemies. That's interesting. And then you see a colon here, and the verse moves on and says, and if any man will hurt them, he, he in this manner must be killed. Okay? He must in this manner be killed. So their enemies are going to be devoured by fire. Well, that happened in the Old Testament. Verse 6, these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, colon. Okay? So I believe... I believe this colon separates the two witnesses. I believe before the colon, it refers to one, and after the colon, it refers to the other. But it says, these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Well, did anybody do that in the Old Testament? Well, Elijah did. It's recorded in, in the Kings. But if you just turn back a few books to the book of James, you'll see it recorded as well. And I personally believe that this verse is probably even referring to the future, not the past. But James 5.17, it says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Three years and six months. That's half of the tribulation. That's 1,260 days. So Elijah did that. And then you see a colon in verse 6, and the verse moves on, and it says, And have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all manner of plagues as often as they will. Well, who did that? That's Moses. And Moses did that. Uh, of course, if you read early there in the book of Exodus, you, you see the waters turned to blood there, and then all kinds of plagues are released upon Egypt. And uh, if, if you really study the book of Exodus, you'll see that now, that whole scenario there was a type of the tribulation. Um, Egypt is a type of the world in the Bible, and though you know those plagues and that judgment from God being released on Egypt was a type of the tribulation period because Pharaoh was a type of the Antichrist, and you know Moses was there. Well, yeah, Moses is going to be there in the future, and so on and so forth. Okay, so it can be proven almost conclusively that the two witnesses are going to be Moses and Elijah. Of course, there's many other proofs of this. Of course, you know, Malachi 4, the last two uh, people mentioned in the Old Testament are Moses and Elijah, 
and the Bible says Elijah's going to come back in the future and all that. I don't have time to get into it all. But you see here that Moses and Elijah are probably, and I, I certainly believe, they are the two witnesses. So Moses' body was buried by the Lord. Michael, the archangel, the devil fought over it. Michael probably took it to heaven so that it could be used again. It was used in the first century, and it will be used in the future. And the body did not stay buried, of course. That would be the second one, would be Moses' corpse was taken, was taken by God into heaven. And now we're going to see the third one of this first set of three chronological bodily raptures. And it is Elijah. This is one of the most famous of the raptures in the Bible because it, it is one of those that involves a man being taken by God into heaven. And this is 2 Kings chapter number 2. 2 Kings chapter number 2, verse number, verse number 11. Verse number 11. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse number 11. It says, And it came to pass, as they still went on, so that's talking about Elisha and Elijah, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire. Uh, that, that's a good study in and of itself, those supernatural horses in the Bible. These are probably the same type of horses we're going to come back on with Christ for the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation chapter number 19. But it says, Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. So it separated them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Okay, So Elijah was taken to heaven. Okay, So that is the first set of three chronological bodily raptures in the Bible. So that was, the, that was uh, as applied to the Old Testament. Now we're going to see the three in the New Testament that have these same characteristics. First, we're going to see Philip. Philip in Acts chapter number 8. We're going to be looking at the last few verses here. Acts chapter number 8. Of course, those who are familiar with the Bible version issue know that verse 37 is removed from most of the new versions because Westcott and Hort decided to pluck it out of their Greek text. And uh, the other Greek texts pretty much followed suit there. But you'll see that, you know, this story is Philip baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch. And verse 39 says, And when they were come up out of the water, so after Philip was done baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch, it said, And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way, his way rejoicing. Now, remember that. The Spirit of the Lord specifically is doing it here. Okay? It's God's Spirit. It's the Spirit of the Lord. But the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, kind of like caught up. He caught away Philip. Now, where did Philip go? Did he go to heaven? Well, the next verse tells you. But Philip was found at Azotus and praising and passing through. He preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Okay, so Philip was found at Azotus. So the Spirit of the Lord took him, lifted him up, and placed him down in Azotus. Uh, it it could have been as quick as as a few seconds. It could have been in, in a in the twinkling of an eye. Okay, but the Spirit of the Lord took him, caught him away, and brought him, placed him down in Azotus. And okay, now we're going to see the next one of this set. And here is 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. And we're going to be looking at the first, uh, the first few verses here, starting in verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse 2. And we're going to see this, this phrase, caught up. 2 Corinthians 12, 2, it says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. And of course, uh, according to these parentheses he has here. It's clear he's talking about himself in the third person. So it says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one, that's himself, Paul writing, such a one caught up to the third heaven. So he was raptured to heaven. Verse 3, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspe unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. So Paul was caught up. He was caught up into the third heaven, into paradise, where paradise was now presently located. In the Old Testament, before the cross, paradise was in the heart of the earth. But now, after Jesus Christ's resurrection, it was taken up to the third heaven, and Paul was caught up. And we're going to see the last one of this set of three individual chronological bodily raptures in each testament. This one is particularly in the New Testament. We're going to see John the Beloved as the third that complete the set. John the Beloved in uh, Revelation 4.1. So just like Enoch's rapture, which 
typologically uh, is symbolic of the rapture of the church. Enoch there was taken by God, taken by God alive up to heaven before the flood. And, you know, of course, Jesus Christ said in the, in the Gospels, he said, as the days of Noe were, that's Noah, as the days of Noe were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So what happened in Noah's time? Well, God released judgment upon the earth as a flood, okay? So if, if, if that flood of God's judgment is representative of the tribulation period, then Enoch was taken by God before the wrath came, before the quote-unquote tribulation came. So that would be a type of our rapture. And here, Revelation 4, 1, we see John the Beloved, not to be not to be confused with John the Baptist, but we see John the Beloved, John the Revelator, in Revelation 4, 1, and this is also a type of the church's rapture. And it says, After this I looked, and behold, there was a door opened in heaven. So when a door is opened in heaven, someone's either going up or going down. And it says, In the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, we're we're going to get to it a little later, but if you read 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, you see the phrase trump of God. Okay, so surrounding our rapture, God's going to sound his voice, and it's going to sound like a trumpet. So this is pretty much the same thing happening here. It says, And the voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee th the things which must be hereafter. So John was raptured, okay? And the Lord said, Come up hither. And I believe that's probably what God's going to say to us at the rapture of the church. He's going to call us by name and probably say, Come up hither. And his voice is going to sound like a trumpet. And uh, really, just just looking at a at a bird's eye view of the Book of Revelation in type, uh, you know, if you had to locate the rapture of the church in type, it would probably be right here. It would be Revelation four one. In chapters two and three, you see the word church uh, again and again. You know, the seven letters to the seven churches. And then after Revelation four one, you don't see the word church until the very very end after the after the time of Jacob's trouble. So uh, typologically, yeah, that this would you know, if you had to locate the rapture, it'd probably be here in type. And then, of course, after Re Revelation 4, the tribulation starts. So, But what I want you to notice is verse 2, is that he actually was caught up, okay? Verse 2, and immediately, okay? Remember that word, immediately. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So right after the Lord said, come up hither to John, to John the Beloved, immediately... He was up in the third heaven. He saw the throne of God. Okay, so it happened immediately, in an instant. So those were the first two sets of five chronological bodily raptures in the scriptures. Those by characteristic were three individual chronologically chronological bodily raptures in each testament. So that takes us up to, what, six. So we saw Moses, we saw Enoch, Moses, Elijah, Philip, Paul, and John. Now we're going to see two other sets of three chronological bodily raptures. And these two are in each testament, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. Turn to the book of Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel. And we're going to see that in each testament, there's a man who's a prophet who just so happens to be called the son of man. And he is raptured thrice surrounding his earthly ministry. That is three times he's raptured surrounding his earthly ministry. The book of Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel. And we're going to start in Ezekiel chapter 3 and look at the first of the three. Okay, so this is a man, he's a prophet, he's called the son of man, and he's raptured three times surrounding his earthly ministry. Ezekiel 3.12, the Bible says, then the spirit, okay, just like Philip in Acts 8, okay, it said, then the spirit took me up. And I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. So this is a rapture of Ezekiel. The Spirit of the Lord took him up. The Spirit took him up. Now we're going to turn to the next reference, Ezekiel chapter number 11. Ezekiel 11, and we're going to look at the first verse once you get there. Ezekiel 11, 1. The Bible says in Ezekiel 11, 1, Here's the second one. It says, moreover, the spirit lifted me up and brought me. See, that's exactly what a rapture is, is when, when God, either by his own hand or by the spirit, takes somebody, lifts them up, and brings them to another place, places them down somewhere else. 
So it said, Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward, and behold, at the door of the gate five and twenty men, and among whom I saw Gazaniah the son of Azer, and Pelatiah the son of Benaniah, princes of the people. So Ezekiel was taken, and he was lifted up by the Spirit and brought unto the east gate of the Lord's house. Well, he wasn't at the east, at the east gate of the Lord's house before, so he was lifted up, brought, taken and brought to another place. Now we're going to see the last of the raptures of Ezekiel, the third one, the third and final one, and that is in Ezekiel 37, toward the end of the book. Ezekiel 37. And here we see it. Ezekiel 37, 1, the Bible says, the hand of the Lord was upon me. Okay, so here's the hand of the Lord. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. And here's the passage, you know, which people refer to as the, of the, um, as the valley of dry bones. What you saw there, that, you know, particularly, particularly with Ezekiel, the hand of the Lord, uh, grabbed him, seized him, lifted him up and carried him and set him down. That's a rapture. So it's when God takes somebody, he lifts them up and places them down in another place. So that's the third of this set of raptures. And now we're going to see another man, but this time in the New Testament. We're going to see another man who happened to be called the Son of Man, and he was a prophet, among other things. And he was raptured thrice surrounding his earthly ministry. And uh, I'm sure everybody knows who this man is. He was not just a man. He was God and man. But the book of Mark, chapter number one, we're going to see the first of these three raptures of this particular prophet who is God manifest in the flesh. Mark chapter number one, and we'll start in verse nine for context. Now, be ready, okay? Read carefully because you might miss it. You might miss it. I, I read through this passage many times, and I missed it. I missed it. But here it is. Mark chapter 1, verse 9, it says, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. Okay? So Jesus was being baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And it goes on, verse 10, And straightway coming up out of the water, so he was fully immersed, and straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit like a dove, descending upon him, and there came a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay, so that's, you know, you, you see the whole Godhead there, all three members, whatever you want to call them. You see the whole God, Godhead there present at the baptism of Jesus. Okay, but the point is, is that Jesus is with John the Baptist in the River Jordan. Okay, that's important. So from verses 9 to 11, Jesus is in that river, is in the River Jordan. In verse 12, you're going to see something interesting. And immediately, okay, remember Revelation 4, 1 through 2, you know, the word immediately, when John was raptured, immediately he was, he was up there before the throne, okay? It says here, and immediately the Spirit, okay, you know, just like Philip, just like Ezekiel, the Spirit some, sometimes raptures people, okay? It says, and immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. So right after that, um, right after his baptism, boom, the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. That is a rapture. That's a rapture. Now we're going to turn to John chapter number 20 for another rapture. The second one. This one's not as clear, but you'll certainly see it after we do some cross-referencing. John chapter number 20. John chapter 20, and we'll look specifically at verse 17. We'll start, uh, let's just start at verse 15 for some context. So here is shortly after the resurrection, okay? It was in the grave three days, you know, in the heart of the earth. And shortly after the resurrection, Mary comes, okay? Verse 15, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, so she, she didn't even recognize him. She, she thought he was just the gardener. Saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. 
She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And you know, it's interesting. The King James Bible always defines itself. Okay, there's a built-in dictionary in the King James Bible, and very rarely will you even need to really consult a dictionary outside the King James Bible in order to understand a word or two. Most words are defined clearly in the King James Bible just through a little study. And here, if you didn't know what Rabboni means, well, the Bible just tells you it means master. Okay, So initially, when, uh, when Mary saw Jesus, she thought him to be the gardener. She didn't recognize him. But when he called her by her name, she recognized him. And knew who he was. And then verse 17, it says, Jesus saith unto her, watch it, okay? It said, the Lord Jesus Christ said, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended unto my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and to your father and to my God and to your God. Okay? That is what Jesus Christ said to Mary shortly after the resurrection. He told her not to touch him. Okay? Why? Well, there's a semicolon. And it, and he's, he went on to say, for I'm not yet ascended to my father. That's the reason. Okay? She was not to touch him because he had not yet ascended to his father. Now, why is that significant? Why am I covering that? Why, why, why am I honing in on that specific part of the verse? Well, let's go ahead and look at Matthew chapter number 28. And we're going to look at a passage in Luke as well, do some cross-referencing, and see why this is of import, why this is a salient verse. Matthew chapter number 28, and we're going to look at verse 9, I believe it is. Yes, Matthew 28, 9. So again, this is after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is obviously afterwards. Um, this is after the, the account of Mary and Jesus in the, in the garden there. But it says here in Matthew 28, 9, it says, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by his feet. So they touched him and worshipped him. Okay, so, so this is after Jesus told Mary not to touch him, for he had not yet ascended. And sometime afterwards, perhaps some hours afterwards, maybe two or three hours, he, uh, he appears to some of his disciples and he met them saying, all hail, and they came and touched him. They held him by his feet and worshipped him. Now we're also going to look at Luke chapter 24, verse 39, and we're going to see the same kind of thing happening. Luke 24, verse 39. Luke 24, 39, it says, Behold, this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, he said, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And that's an interesting study on glorified bodies, flesh and bones. But again, the, this is sometime after he told Mary, touch me not, for I'm not yet ascended. And he, he appears here, and he even instructs people this time to touch him. He said, behold, my hands and my feet, that is I myself, handle me. He's saying, come on, touch me, check me out, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. So what does this mean? What this means is between the time Jesus told Mary, touch me not for I'm not yet ascended unto my father, between that time and those other two recorded instances of Jesus allowing people to touch him and even commanding people to touch him, between that time and the span of a few hours, the Lord Jesus Christ did ascend to his father and come back down. Okay. And what I do want to, and what I do want to read is I do want to read a, a note from Dr. Ruckman describing this instance because it's very good. He says in his reference Bible, under the note on John 20, 17, speaking about what happens, well, what happened, he said, referring to Jesus, he said, he stands before Mary sinless, with no blood, preparing to ascend to the Father in glory to present himself as the propitiation for our sins. Okay, and he, and he, and he cites Romans 3, 25, and 1 John 2, 2, okay? So what happened was he was there. He was without any blood. He shed all his blood on the cross. He had no blood in his body. He was standing there, flesh and bones before Mary. He was standing before her sinless. And he told her, touch me not, for I'm not yet ascended to my father. And between she, the, and between the, the time that she left and, 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 the, and the time that he met some of his disciples and other people and allowed him to touch him, he went up to the, uh, to the Lord, up into heaven, and presented himself as the propitiation for our sins and then came back down. That's what happened. So that's the second rapture surrounding 
his earthly ministry. Now we're going to look at the last one. Everybody knows this one. This is Acts chapter number 1. Acts chapter number 1, and we'll start in verse 8 for context. Okay, as as many people say, you know, um, there there's some confessions of faith and creeds and such, and some of them are Catholic and some of them aren't. But um, what what a lot of people say is, you know, they they say something to to the likes of, I affirm that I believe in the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, and that ascension is here in Acts chapter number one, where Jesus Christ ascends into heaven. Acts chapter number one verse eight. If you have a, if you have a red letter Bible, you'll see that it's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking here in verse eight. And he says, "But you shall receive power after the whole after after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you." He's talking to the people there, uh, and ye shall be my witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Okay, that's what it said. And then verse nine, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, taken up. Well, I. I I believe that, that that is the same terminology that was used with Ezekiel. And Ezekiel was taken up, which is interesting. And, and the verse goes on to say, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So Jesus Christ was taken up. He was taken up by the Lord. And, um, and yeah, that, that would be the third. And moving on here. So that would take us up to 12. Up to 12. All right. So now we're going to look at the three, what I call the three tribulation raptures. Okay. So that takes us up to the 12, and now we're going to see another three. That should take us up to 15. So as I said, I believe there's five sets of three chronological bodily raptures in the Bible. And... Um, and we saw first three from the Old Testament regarding individuals, three from the New Testament regarding individuals, uh, three from the Old Testament, three of one individual, and three of another individual in each testament, three raptures of one person. And now we're going to see three tribulation raptures, which obviously these are future. We are not in the time of Jacob's trouble, and we will not be in the time of Jacob's trouble, those of you who are saved. Amen. At this moment in time. So the first one, uh, which everybody should know, especially uh, if you're saved, of course, is the one in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Okay, this is the rapture of the church, the rapture of the church. Starting in verse 13, Paul writes, and he starts talking about this rapture. And, you know, this, this is the rapture that that people refer to as the rapture. You know, most uh, in most conversations, when, when people say the rapture, they're referring to the rapture of the church because that's the one that pertains to us most. That's the one we're supposed to be looking for and having our minds set upon all the time. And he starts out in verse 13. He said, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Okay, so he's not to have us ignorant of this of this truth. Okay, you're not to be ignorant of it. You're supposed to know about it. And uh, and there, there are um, seven times in the Bible where Paul tells us not to be ignorant of something. And here's one of them. And he says, But I'll not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that is, those who are dead in Christ right now, as we'll see moving on, be sleep as a type of death. And it says, Brethren, concerning them which are asleep, and that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Okay? So, you know, all of us have, have loved ones, uh, most likely, that are Christians that have died and went to be with the Lord. And we're not to sorrow over them so much. Because of this truth, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. So those others are lost people. They are without hope and without God, the Bible says. So there are others that sorrow continually because they have no hope. They, they don't have this blessed hope, and they don't have the hope of glory, Jesus Christ. And if you're in Christ, you do have this blessed hope, Titus 2.13, which is the rapture. But there are lost people who sorrow continually because... They know they're not going to see their loved ones again because they don't believe in a heaven. They don't believe in a hell, and you know they, they just believe you just stop existing when you die. Obviously, that's not the case. You either go to heaven or go to hell immediately. You can read Luke 16 for that, for instance. But moving on, verse 14, it said, "For if, for if we believe, okay, here, here's the condition: for if we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again." Okay, so if you're saved, if you believe that, okay, if we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. 
Okay, So if you believe the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're trusting his blood shed on the cross to save you. Okay, If you believe that, then even so them which sleep in Jesus, them who have died, the Christians that lived before us and went on before us, them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. So when, when Jesus Christ is coming, coming down to the clouds to call us up, he's also bringing the souls of the, of the Christians that have lived before us. In verse 15 he says, for this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, so those of us who will who will be alive when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back for the rapture of the church, that will most likely be us. Amen. And it says, those um, we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the dead in Christ shall rise first. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come down with, with their souls from the third heaven. Their souls are going to be put into their bodies, and there's going to be a resurrection, and they shall rise first. After that, verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's a rapture. Every single time that word, that phrase caught up appears in the Bible, it's a rapture. We saw it in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Here we see it in 1 Thessalonians 4. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. These are comforting words. The doctrine of the rapture is comforting. Okay, it's comforting because, number one, we're going to see our our loved ones in Christ again. You know, um, maybe you have a sister or a brother or father or friend who... Who was uh, who was saved and then, you know, uh, went to be with the Lord? Well, don't sorrow because guess what? You're going to see him again, okay? And uh, you're going to see him. And another reason why these are comforting words is because we're not going to go through God's wrath. We are not appointed unto wrath, the Apostle Paul says. And the time of Jacob's trouble is a period of wrath. So we're not going to go through that future time period. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 is the other place where Paul records this mystery. This is one of the mysteries. And uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. We'll start, we'll start there. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Okay, so, so our bodies are not all just going to stay dead. Okay, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of in a twinkling of an eye, that kind of sounds like immediately to me, but in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought, pa brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. In victory. So that is the rapture of the church before the tribulation. Okay, that is the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Okay, now what we're going to look at is what I call the mid-tribulation rapture. Okay, now, and I say, okay, well, you know, I've never heard of this one. Well, just bear with me here. Bear with me. And again, um, just because of the pattern and the typology of the previous 12 raptures, I believe that there, there probably has to be three tribulation pa uh, raptures in order to follow this pattern. Um is these raptures have appeared in sets of three. Okay, so this is, uh, we, we just saw the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I believe there's a mid-tribulation rapture and a post-tribulation rapture. And another reason why I believe that is because, as, uh, as one preacher would say, he said that almost all false doctrine and false teachings that are being circulated today are a truth that's misplaced. A truth that is misplaced. Okay, so the... the the, the reason why, why many people in different denominations get messed up is because they're taking a truth that is in the Bible, but they're misplacing it, okay? So, you know, um, whether they're going to an Old Testament passage that's, you know, talking about the nation of Israel and the Old Testament corporal, uh, corporally, or, you know, they, they, they go to somewhere in the Gospels, which might have, you know, an application to the millennium or to the people in that age or to the tribulation, um, what, what, what they'll often do is they'll take a truth— but they won't rightly apply it. They won't rightly divide it. They will steal somebody else's mail. They'll go to a passage that is that is directed at somebody else, and then try to apply that to the church, and that doesn't work. Uh, if you do that, you're 
you're going to be confused, and God's not the author of confusion. Okay, so you know, like an example, of this would be like Seventh Day Adventists in the Sabbath. Well, right now, most Christians do not observe the Sabbath. Well, why? Well, there's many reasons. Number one, the Sabbath was assigned to Israel, and the Bible says Jews require a sign. Uh, the church or Gentiles don't require a sign. And Paul, who's our apostle, in Romans chapter 13, he lists out the Ten Commandments, and guess which one he he leaves out? The fourth one, okay? Referring to the Sabbath, because um, us Christians are not bound under the Sabbath. We, we don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore, okay? So I believe that there are three tribulation raptures because people get messed up, okay? Um, people place the rapture of the church before the tribulation, rightly. Some people wrongly place it in the middle, like, you know, Stephen Anderson and his followers, which, you know, they'll say post-trib pre-wrath, but what they really mean is in the middle of the seven years. And then and then you have real posty-toasties, so-called, that uh, place the rapture of the church all the way at the end, all the way at the end, which, <laughs> that honestly, that, that position is... That position is just lunacy. But so because people get messed up, I believe that there probably is a rapture in the middle and at the end. Um, and 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 that that's really why these people are getting messed up is because they're not rightly dividing it. Because the one in the middle and the one at the end isn't the church. Okay, The church doesn't go through a second of the time of Jacob's trouble. It's Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. It's all about Israel and so forth. I'm not going to go on a tangent about that. But here's what I believe is the mid-tribulation rapture. Okay, so Revelation chapter 11, and we'll start in, uh, let's see, verse number 8, okay? Now, some people place the ministry of the two witnesses in the, in the, in the second half, and I'm open to that, but I personally believe I lean toward it being in the first half. And if it's not in the first half, then I believe another group are going to be raptured in the middle. And that's just my theory here. But verse number 8, and their dead bodies, that's the, rap, that's the, the two witnesses there, Verse 7, you, uh, that, that records their death. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, the beast is the Antichrist, that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, I believe that's Judas Iscariot, shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Okay, so so the Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses, they're, they're going to have their heads chopped off because that, that is the Antichrist's method of execution. And that has some ritualistic elements to it, uh, which I'll not get into. But verse 8, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And uh, jumping down to verse 12, and after three days, so their bodies are going to lay there in the streets three days. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Okay, so they're resurrected, but is there a rapture here? Well, yeah, verse 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. Exactly what uh, what was told to John. Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their bodies, uh, excuse me, and their enemies beheld them. Okay? So I believe that that's probably in the middle. If it's not, then I personally would think it would have to be the 144,000 that are that are raptured in the middle. Because obviously, Revelation chapter 7, you, you see them... Um, it would be verses 4 to, what, 8? Yeah, verses 4 to 8. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. You know, <laughs> the, the, these uh, obviously aren't Christians or, you know, or Jehovah's Witnesses, you know. Not the fake Jehovah's Witnesses that are running around today, but these are real Jehovah's Witnesses. These are Jews, and there are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. You see you see the tribes there, Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtalium, Manassas, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zabulon, Joseph and Benjamin, and of course the tribe of Dan is left out for a reason. But we see twelve thousand from each of the twelve tribes. That's one hundred and forty-four thousand, uh, and they're on the earth there. And then you know when he turned to Revelation chapter fourteen, they're they're seen in heaven. They're in heaven. Uh, verse three. It says, uh, and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. So. Uh, what happened to them? Well, you know, may, maybe they're all martyred. Maybe they're raptured. May, maybe both happen. <laughs> may, maybe they're all martyred and then immediately they're raptured. Who knows? Um, but I personally lean toward believing that the two witnesses probably get raptured in the middle. If not, I believe it would probably have to be the 144,000. And there's many people that teach that they do get raptured in the middle. Uh, I believe Sam Gipp teaches that also. Uh, I think Finest Dake taught that as well now of course wouldn't recommend following him but he might he might have this one thing right so it'd be the mid-trib 
rapture of the two witnesses and or the 144,000. Now we're going to look at the post-tribulation rapture of tribulation saints, which would mostly be the elect of Israel. So go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 24. We're going to see the post-tribulation rapture of the church here. I mean, not the church, excuse me. <laughs> Maybe a church, quote-unquote, but it's not the church as in the body of Christ. You know, in, in, in Acts, it called, you know, Israel, you know, the church that was in the wilderness, so a called-out assembly. This would be a called-out assembly, but it wouldn't be the church as in the church of the church age, the body of Christ, that have promises of eternal security and so on and so forth. But if you turn to Matthew chapter 24, here, here's, a, here's a passage where a lot of people break their necks theologically, so to speak. Um, there, there's not a single Christian in the passage, okay? Um, you can take a flashlight and, and look through the passage. You, you won't find a single Christian there. And, and at this time, when Jesus was speaking, there was no such thing as a Christian, okay? Um, when Jesus is speaking here, it's the Old Testament. Uh, people are like, what? Yeah, it's, it's the Old Testament, because guess what? According to Hebrews chapter number 9, the New Testament commenced with the death of Christ. Christ didn't die yet. Okay, the, this is during his earthly ministry before the crucifixion. So this is still Old Testament. And who is Jesus speaking to? Well, Jesus is a Jew, <laughs> a rabbi, and you know, mainly his earthly ministry was to the Jews. Okay, it was to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Okay, and he, as a Jew, as a quote unquote Orthodox Jew, he is he's speaking to other Jews. He's speaking to pork abstaining, Sabbath keeping, law abiding, bearded circumcised Jews, okay? That's who he's speaking to. And um, it really all starts in verse uh, verse 13, though you could probably jump it up to verse 11, you know, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Well, yeah, uh, there is going to be a false prophet in the future. But uh, verse 13, it says, but he that shall endure to the name shall be saved. That's tribulation salvation, which has an element of faith and works in it. You have to endure to the end to be saved. And verse 14, and the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. Well, that's not the gospel we we preach today, okay? Uh, and and, and you, you, you might be wincing at that, but uh, that's the truth. We preach the gospel of the grace of God, okay? The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? That is not the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, okay? You, you can go to Matthew chapter 4 and see that. That is the gospel which the, which the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples were preaching during his earthly ministry. Okay, during his earthly ministry, they were not preaching the death, burial, and resurrection because, number one, it hadn't happened yet. Okay, number two, the, the apostles didn't even understand it at that time. You know, he, he, he tried to tell them repeatedly, but, you know, one time I believe – um, it's recorded that Peter even rebuked him for saying that. They didn't even understand. Okay, so they weren't preaching the death, burial, and resurrection. They were preaching that the kingdom was a coming. Okay, so that gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached in the future, which is not our gospel. And Paul said during this age, if any man preach any, any other gospel, let him be accursed. Okay, so this has to be during a future age. Uh, after the after the church age is closed out, and this is a tribulation passage, and you see in verse 20, pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Your flight there, I believe that's probably a literal flight, but it said pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Well, yeah, us Christians don't keep the Sabbath, okay? So the whole passage is, is about Jews to Jews, and, and uh, really they're, they're going to need to know this because – there's going to be many Jews who are going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, that is Israel's trouble. Now, uh, turning to verse 27, later in the chapter, we see here this uh, post-tribulation rapture of tribsates, the elect of Israel. It says, for as the um, – yeah, verse 27, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That's interesting that uh, that phrase, Son of Man, is um, – is really applicable to Israel. You know, that that mainly has to do with Jesus Christ being the Messiah to the Jewish people, okay? Paul never uses the term son of man in, in, in any of his epistles. He uses the term son of God, and that that's, that, that's what the church is mostly con, uh, concerned with, is that Jesus Christ is the son of God. He's our savior, but... Um, when it comes to who who he who he is the Messiah to, he's the Messiah to Israel. So that term has to do with the Messiah to Israel. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. 
And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. That gives you a, a hint there. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. You know, the, the Bible says that they will look upon him whom they pierced. And the Bible says, and, and when he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, one from, uh, from one end of heaven to the other. Uh, th that, that word elect almost always in the Bible refers to Israel, and the whole passage is about Israel. And, um, and it's angels that, that do the gathering here. Angels, okay? When talk about the the rapture of the church, uh, no angels are referenced in taking us up. It's just that, you know, we're, we're commanded and we go up, okay? It's not that angels have to grab us and take us places. Now, th there, there are some people that believe that uh, that this rapture is 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 just a horizontal gathering where they're they're taken and then they're 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 placed somewhere else on the earth and some people believe they're they're taken up into heaven okay so either way they're taken by god lifted up and placed somewhere else and that's called a rapture whether you believe they get taken to heaven at that point or they're gathered uh at a different part of the earth that is nonetheless a rapture so that takes us up to 15 raptures Okay, those were the five sets of three chronological bodily raptures, uh, all running all throughout the Bible. Now what we're going to see is we're going to see the last two. There's one at the very beginning of the Bible and one at the very end of the Bible. One to open the Bible and one to close the Bible, so to speak. If you will, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter number 2. Genesis chapter number 2. And we'll look at verse 15. And remember that verse reference. 215. 215. Genesis 215. And uh, this is a rapture of Adam. <laughs> you know, and so, some people say, oh, there's a rapture of Adam. I've never heard such a thing. Well, we're going to look at the verse here. Okay. The verse says, 215, Genesis 215. And the Lord got... The Lord God took the man. Now, interesting, it said God took. God took. That phrase only appears one other time in the Bible. We're going to get to that. But it says, and the Lord God took the man. Okay, that's Adam. Adam means man, and that's, you know, really the only man walking around at this point. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So Adam was outside the garden of Eden. Got him, uh, God seized him, lifted him up, and placed him into the garden of Eden. That's a rapture. Now, the, the other reason you know it's a rapture is because of that phrase, God took, okay? It only appears twice in the Bible, and because of, you know, Scripture is Scripture and parallelism, we're going to see that that both references re refer to the same type of thing. Where, where else does that phrase, God took, appear? Well, Genesis 5.24, the first one we looked at. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So in Enoch's case, God took him, okay? He, he took him to heaven. Okay, that's a rapture, and in Adam's case, God took him, and he placed him in the garden, and that's a rapture. Okay, so that's the first rapture. That's the rapture of the first Adam. It's the first rapture in the Bible. And now turn to Revelation chapter number 12 for one to really close the Bible. Revelation chapter number 12. Revelation 12.5. Okay, now now remember, we, we just saw Genesis 2.15. That's the first book of the Bible. Now, Revelation 12.5, the last book of the Bible. Each verse reference has a 1, 2, and a 5 in it. It's only composed of three numbers, and they're 1, 2, and 5. Revelation 12.5. Okay, and she brought forth, so she is Israel. Okay, if you read the passage and study it out. Revelation 12, 5, and she, that's Israel, brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up. That's a rapture. Every single time you see the word caught up in the Bible, it's a rapture. And, and her child was caught up unto God into his throne. Now, there's uh, there's many different opinions about who this man-child could be, and uh, and I don't know. I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure anybody can really say for certain there's different theories. Uh, some say it's the Lord Jesus Christ, which, you know, uh, certainly uh, spiritually speaking, in a spiritual application, it would, but doctrinally, I'm not sure if that's the case. Uh, it it kind of makes me think it might be Jesus Christ, because the first rapture was the rapture of the first Adam, and that means this would be the rapture of the last Adam, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. But 
I lean toward another alternative. Now, some people say it's Jesus Christ. Uh, some people say it's um, as to be synonymous with the post-tribulation rapture. I, I don't necessarily believe that. So it would be tribulation saints if that was the case. Some say, like I, I believe Finest Dake taught this, that uh, that this would be the rapture of the 144,000. I don't necessarily believe that either, but that's interesting. Um, and one possibility that a certain Bible teacher put forth is that um, is that according to some other passages, um, this could be referring to an individual who is a Jewish deliverer who leads who leads Israel into the wilderness uh, for the last half of the tribulation, and while he he does so, he gets captured. Now, if that's the case, I have a theory as to as to who he might be, and uh, that would be. Recorded in the book of Matthew. In the book of Matthew. Okay, Matthew chapter 16. This is personally my theory. Uh, as of right now, I might change my mind, but it's interesting nonetheless. If you turn to Matthew chapter 16, verse 14, starting verse 13 for context, you'll see something interesting here. Matthew 16, 13. It says... When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, I've been there, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Okay, so, so he's asking his disciples, you know, he, he's asking them what, uh, what kind of rumors and theories uh, are, are circulating among, among the Jews as to who Jesus is. Okay, they're, they're, uh, he's asking them, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So, so he's asking them, okay, you know, what, what are people saying about me? Verse 14. Okay, and 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 uh, this is what they said. They they're responding, and they say, and they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Well, that wasn't true. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Some say Elias. Well, that's interesting because yeah, there's Old Testament verses that say that Elijah is coming back. So they had a right to right to think that because they were expecting Elijah to come back, and he will. Some say Elias, and others Jeremiah. Okay, that's the, the Greek form of the word Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So it's interesting. Uh, it seems that perhaps the, the Jews in the first century were expecting Jeremiah to come back in the future, uh, which very well could be. There, there, there's, there's scores of people who are coming back in the future. You have Moses and Elijah who represent the law and the prophets. They're coming back. Um, there, there's a passage that, that looks like John. John the Revelator is coming in the future. He's coming back. Uh, there, there's even a verse in Matthew uh, where it looks like the the twelve apostles are coming back, and you say, "Well, Judas included." Well, technically, Judas included because he would be the antichrist. Okay, so so there, there's all kinds of people coming back. Jeremiah could come back, and if Jeremiah does come back, I believe he might be the man child. Okay, he might be. Now, why do you say that? Well, if you uh, if you look at the book of Jeremiah, verse twenty. Excuse me, chapter 20, verse 15, you'll see he's called something interesting. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 15. And uh, verse 14 for context, this is Jeremiah speaking, of course, and it says, Cursed be the day wherein I was born. So he's kind of kind of like uh, going through a Job experience right now. Uh, he said, Cursed be the day wherein I was born. Let not the day wherein my mother bear me be blessed. Verse 15, cursed be the man who brought tidings to my father, saying, a man child is born unto thee, making him very glad. So he's talking about himself there, and he calls himself a man child. So if, if the Jews were right to expect that Jeremiah was coming back in the future, then it could be Jeremiah who's the man child. I don't know. That's just a theory, and uh, if that's the case, then then that would mean that there would have to be some Old Testament justification for Jeremiah coming back, and I've yet to find that. Maybe one of you is smarter than me, and we'll find a verse that seems to indicate that, but that is just my theory. So that would be all 17 raptures in the King James Bible, starting with Adam all the way down to the man-child, who you know, is kind of contested. It's kind of a mystery as to who that man-child is, whether it's a group of people or a singular person. But quickly, what I will do is I will just w uh, run through the seven successful trips in the outer space because we, we did cover all of them, but I didn't cover them in this systematic order. The first one was Moses, okay, and that's Deuteronomy 34 and cross-references there. The second one is Paul, 
Okay, he, he went through outer space in order to get to the third heaven. That's 2 Corinthians 12. The third one is John the Beloved. Yeah, he went up. He was caught up, went right up. Jesus, of course, that would be John 20. We saw that. He had, he had to ascend to the Father and come back down. Enoch, Genesis 5. Yeah, he went all the way up. Elijah, 2 Kings 2. He went all the way up. And again, Jesus in Acts 1. So those are seven successful trips into outer space made by individuals. And that would be a seven out of the 17, according to characteristics. So I pray that, uh, that this Bible study edified you, that it's, uh, that it's a blessing, and that you learn something. And again, uh, I just uh, ask all of you to look over these things, search the scriptures, and uh, see, see whether these things are so. Maybe you might find an extra rapture, or maybe you might not agree with me on one or two of the raptures. That's up to you. That's just between you and the Lord. But just pray that uh, this was edifying and that, um, this, and that this uh, provoked you to, to study and to, to think these things over. And that's it. Amen. Amen. Wow, that was uh, whoa. That was like a really uh really big Bible study there, man. Um when most people think of 17 raptures, that usually goes over most people's heads, but I do believe there's there's around close to 17 raptures. You just showed the scripture on it and and of course the scripture convinced me. So yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. Wow. You know, I hope I hope this was a blessing to everyone listening. This is a a really tightly meat truck of a study. <laughs> right here really tightly a tight meat truck there so i hope i hope you guys found it a blessing and and then you could pray the pray to the lord and check the scriptures out as he said and to see if these things are so and perhaps do your own little study maybe you can find more who knows this book the king james bible has more than a lot of information in it it's it's an infinite book it, the book just keeps revealing more and more and more and more so praise the Lord for that. That just goes to show that the book is alive. The King James Bible is alive. Amen. Amen. All right, then. So this is uh, KJB Believers here. This was Brother Samuel's study on the 17 raptures of the Bible. And this is Brother Fabro here. And I'll be catching you guys in the next time. Peace.